I'll introduce myself for uh, for those watching on recording. I'm Mel, I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director at All Brains Belong, and welcome to our monthly family lunch and learn. Um, what I will do is I will just set the stage with some com a community agreement, but this is a super, this is a super casual discussion. And then I will introduce Sarah to frame our discussion. Share screen. So I think I think most of you here have uh, been to ADB events before, but to recap, you can participate however you want to, as you've already figured out. Um, having your video off is totally acceptable. And if you ever pop it on, we don't expect anything of you. You can communicate however you're most comfortable, and we're going to just keep this to be a, a safe space uh, for education purposes. And, you know, since we are going to be talking about, I guess it is probably worth mentioning the last bullet point, um, in, 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 in that uh, this, this is for education purposes, and um, we'll just, like, think about not, not um, you know, processing individual traumatic experiences, since this is not a therapeutic setting. Okay. Um, now I'm going to introduce our community programs coordinator, Sarah Wilkins. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Lunch and Learn. Um, today we are joined by Anna House. And Anna is a personal transformation uh, support person who also helps heal the whole family through online education and family coaching. And today we're going to be talking about letting go of guilt and shame on your parenting journey. <laughs> Anna, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, All Brains Belong community is one of my favorite places to be. I always feel so welcome and included here. And I feel like I can just bring my whole self. And that um, is such an important part of healing, especially shame and guilt. Um, <laughs> so... Um, as Mel said, this is really casual and intimate space today. There's no slides. I'm going to try not to talk for too long, but I kind of wanted to set the stage just by sharing like a couple little chunks of my own story. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I am right now working as a family coach and um, I'm working to hold space for people through their through their healing journeys, specifically around what it might look like to um, unpack our parenting practices to really meet that desire that I believe all parents have for deep connection, um, joy, and ease in our lives with our kids. And that can so easily get um, tripped up by a lot of the messages that we get from society, from other family members, you know, from um, just walking around in the world. Like there's a lot of messages that um, leave us feeling like I'm just the worst parent in the world. And <laughs> it sucks. Um, and one of the reasons this topic came up when, when Sarah and I were talking about hosting this um, family lunch and learn is because I'm currently um, hosting an online course called Roots to Grow, Wings to Fly. And in this course, I offer, um, you know, fi five modules of kind of going through slowing down, building trust and creating connection with our kids. And, um, and with this online course, when families um, purchase it, they have the opportunity to join um, a cohort or a community of families to do five weeks of live family coaching with me and the other families. And I just finished the first cohort of families that came through. And I was so inspired um, by the vulnerability that the families who joined this community um, shared with me. And um, one of the things that we know about guilt and shame is that actually the antidote is vulnerability, is actually sharing with each other about our vulnerable um, experiences and then realizing that we're not alone. Um, and, 
in the very first session with these families, every single one just introducing themselves came on and said, well, everybody here is probably a way better parent than me. I'm, I'm the worst. I'm doing a terrible job. I don't, you know, I need help. Um, and it was like, unbelievable that family after family came and was definitely sure that they were the worst one in the group. And it's like, oh no, how did we get here? Why do we compare each other, compare ourselves to others so immediately? Um, and well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons we do that. And, um, and so I wanted to start just by sharing, um, two of my own stories and, a little bit about myself and then just open this up so that we can have the, you know, the, the last, the rest of the like 45 minutes together, just um, opening it up to, you know, either asking questions or sharing with each other our own experiences so that we can begin to have that practice of um, being vulnerable together so we can recognize we're not alone and maybe just maybe shed a little bit of that shame and guilt that we feel. Um, Oh, so <laughs> just taking a deep breath because that's a good place to start. <sighs> Allowing my brain to remember that I'm safe here. This is my favorite place to be, as I mentioned. Um, so this week I listened to Mel sharing with the Vermont Family Network about PDA. And it was so cool. It really was so cool. I was like, every single thing, I was like, ding, light bulb, ding, light bulb. You know, so many things about my experience with my kid were were uncovered. But in particular, one, one thing that really stuck out for me was um, that, you know, not only in the first week of having my child home did I realize she had some unique needs that I had no idea about and I just needed to like unlearn everything I ever thought I knew about parenting. But by the time she was two and a half and she literally just like laughed in my face when I tried to <laughs> set any kind of boundaries or rules, then now she's 16 and I'm really in for it. And so um, uh, just last night, she had a Valentine that for whatever some reason was a Reese's peanut butter cup put on the end of a wooden skewer. <laughs> and this wooden skewer was so sharp. And she was like, I don't know, like holding it. So the point was like all near her face and her neck. And I just couldn't help myself. I was like, don't poke yourself with the skewer. So what did she do? <laughs> she just like jabbed it into her neck. I was like, oh my God, I am the worst parent in the world. I just learned about PDA. I should have known not to make a demand like that. Right? I just thought, oh, I failed. I have definitely failed. <laughs> uh, for those of you who aren't watching, Mel is making the connection hand signal for me. So I'm feeling like that piece of vulnerability that allows me to not be alone in such a big way. So thank you, Mel, for, share, for sharing some physical gestures of connection I'm watching. Um, so just to unpack a couple of other little things, and then I want to share one more story. Um, in Also, Mel, in that um, in that presentation, you talked about how just energetically, if we're energetically having a demand, like our brain is saying, I want my kid to stop doing this. And then our bodies actually send a vibrational signal to our kid that their autonomy is being threatened. It's game over. Like <laughs> it's game over. So um, I, I wanted to share, and I can share a little bit more about this at the end, that I am hosting a free, um, a free Zoom opportunity in about a week and a half where I share some of my experience. So my, my training is as an educator and as a parent, parenting is probably the biggest educational journey I've been on. <laughs> and then I also graduated from the Barbara Brennan School of Healing, where I actually studied the anatomy of the human energy field and the chakra systems. So that um, I've actually mapped out some experiences that I've had with my own kids and how the energy, actual energetic response that I have um, 
having a conscious energetic response instead of that like immediate brain reaction like don't poke yourself in the neck with that stick right <laughs> if I would have I you know used some of my own skills in that moment um I, you know, it could have been maybe a different outcome. And so some of those skills that I've learned in the ways that I've been able to map it out energetically, I'm offering in this free webinar that, and the, the link is in the chat. Okay, last story, and then I'm going to stop talking. This one, now I, I, I decided to go with the easy story first, because this one's a lot more vulnerable. Um, so... I was a very young parent. My oldest kid is now 23 years old. And as a very young parent, um, I felt like it was just like us against the world. And so I started out my parenting journey with this assumption that around any corner, someone could take my kid from me if I wasn't proving that I was being like the best parent in the world. And I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, and so because of that, one of the things I didn't see right away was that I put on this like perfect parent mask where I like when I went into the world, it was like, oh, everything's great. Everything's great. I love being a mom. Like, oh yeah, he eats all his vegetables. And you know, I don't know. I don't know exactly how it showed up to everybody else. But it wasn't until years later, now that I have friends, you know, in their 30s and even early 40s who are just having kids, they're like, why didn't you tell me this was so hard? Meanwhile, these were friends of mine who were like close to me when I was a young parent. It was the hardest swear word, beep, I'm going to bleep myself out, the hardest thing I ever did in my life. It was excruciatingly hard. And I didn't know that the people close to me couldn't see that. And I was so, I was like heartbroken when my friends started saying things like that to me. Like, why didn't you tell me this was so hard? I was like, are you kidding? You're 36 years old. You have a savings account and health insurance and food on the table and a great home to live in. Like, I didn't even have any of those things. How can you even tell me that what I was doing wasn't hard? But I didn't realize that I had been inadvertently like putting up this this like thick layer of perfect parent illusion um while on the inside I just was sure that I was failing and was convinced again that like if anyone found out I would be like it would be the end um so I think that's, I think I didn't go into a lot of details with that story, but I, I can tell by the, some of the chat that, um, people are understanding what I'm trying to share. Um, and so part of what I really work hard to do now is to share the stories of how hard it is and how I never really know what I'm doing. Um, I always feel like I'm just making it up as I go. Um, and so you know, that it's interesting because now I want to offer support to others and I don't paint myself, this picture of myself as like, I'm an expert. I know. Oh, it's like this one size fits all fix. You just do this and you're going to, it's going to be great. It's like, no, no, actually the solution that worked yesterday, chances are I'm going to try it today and it's not going to work. And that's okay. Um, because we're all changing and learning and growing and it, and it is it is an evolutionary process. It is like a experimental process. That's one of the principles I teach. I call it the scientific method of parenting. It's all a hypothesis. <laughs> and you just try to <laughs> you try things and see which ones work and see which ones don't work. And back to the drawing board tomorrow. I can jump in. Please do. I, I think the thing that I, sh I mean, there's like a million things I struggle with, but like one of the things that I struggle with, like on a daily basis is in addition to, um, you know, thinking about like what, what other people, you know, judge me for or whatever it's, 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 um, in many ways that part 
has been easier to like spot name override because like after joining a community of people who all say that and then I'm like oh okay well because it's the shame it's the shame thing and so shame um breeds in silence and secrecy and so when you tell someone about the thing and someone says me too um the idea would be that you you know hopefully feel less horrible because secrecy and silent you know all of that is is not present it's it's an it's you know it's not present as an ingredient um um like Brene Brown would say um but it's the internal shame it's the internal judgment that part that part sucks Cause like today, for example, this morning, um, babysitter yesterday brought like all the, all the cookies. And so that places me in a position of needing to set limits because like, I might say in a PDA household, you know, quote, try not to set arbitrary limits and yet, much, um, you know, uh, maybe not as maybe not the equivalent of like, don't poke yourself in the face, but like, I felt like, you know, in my mind, I had the vision of the going to the dentist and the drill and like all the things and like how I didn't want to deal with all of that. And so that is my drive to be like, you, you can't in fact eat an entire box of cookies again. Cause like, this is how yesterday went. So I set the limit. Ah! And then like, you know, so much for mama baby morning, because now, because I set an involved, you know, an, an arbitrary limit, I cued threat, I cued lack of safety. It's not her fault. It's part of her disability. Um, and that's how it's all going to go every time I set an arbitrary limit. But then I'm like, you like teach people about PDA. Like what, it's like what you do for a living. Like like why did you like that so it's like the self-judgment that 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 sucks it sucks so much and it's like every day multiple times a day mm -hmm. yeah sometimes I feel like the more you know the harder it is because you know like there's a better way to be doing this and I'm not doing that <laughs> that better way so it's like double shame because it's like shame like how are we in this situation again and then it's shame like how could I do this thing that I know is going to just result in total dysregulation <laughs> yeah and um and then for me I just get this like imposter syndrome right because I even said it out loud to all of you guys like I was like I'm literally hosting and you know a webinar on five tools to use in this scenario that I didn't use so what gives me the right to even think I can help other people <laughs> well you know I'd say as a parent like if I attend a webinar and some expert like gets up there and being like I have the magic tools and you just do what I do and you live happily like like my like my PDA like I'm a PDA or two my, I'm like ah, unsafe unsafe Anyway, so like I find it helpful to hear that people are like real people more than I do about like mm -hmm. watch my blissful way of life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just want to name too because this helps me heal this part of myself, right? The same part of myself that created the perfect parent mask also creates like the educator mask, right? And it's like really easy for me to be like, I have all the solutions. <laughs> to this other I'm like who is that lady <laughs> I love the voice like the character voices we both took on of like this is what fakeness sounds like <laughs> uh, yeah but the reality is you know I'm glad you said that it actually is so similar to my authentic self right it's like so close because I am an educator like actually my my like spirit like leaps at the opportunity to be in the space where I can um where I can share. And when I remind myself that actually sharing my failures makes me more human <laughs> um, in the and, and provides the opportunity or almost the invitation for deeper connection with other people, um, it actually like meets that desire. And I forget sometimes when I go into teacher mode, it's so similar to my authentic self that it's hard to recognize um, but then I can tell because it has this texture of disconnection, 
and I'm not connected to the people that I'm talking to. And then I'm like, oh, this sucks. This doesn't feel right. Why doesn't this feel right? And I would say that, um, you know, whether, whether we're talking about, you know, kids with a PDA profile or, or not, I think that there's a lot of nervous systems that are really sensitive to energy, right? And so like, I think that lots of people of all ages can discern when someone is not real and that actually feels unsafe. So, and it's hard because um, many layers of masking are involuntary. So like you go into this situation and you're putting on the mask involuntarily yourself and it's, it's, it's habit, it's survival, it's whatever, but it's, it's automatic. It's not a choice. It comes out and that's, that's what goes on. And then the kids like, I feel that I feel that. And it's unsafe. And like the, the, the dysregulation happens. And I imagine that happens like all day long in, in classrooms, um, you know, in addition to homes. Um, like, so, um, my, my thing when I, when I, when I work with, groups of kids is the whole time I talk about like, so this morning I flipped my lid and like, and then like, those are like the only things I talk about now. Um, and cause it's normal. It's like so normal. Yeah. Um, I wish wanted to say thanks to Kat. I'm looking back at the chat and like, I really identify with what you wrote here. like, I only learned about PDA. Like, I don't know, maybe you mentioned it to me the first time a few months ago, Mel. And then I really only learned about like the brain science of it. When I watched that YouTube, that was so helpful. I'm like, wow, this makes so much sense. But somehow there was like a little piece of me that knew about this before. And so that's the thing is like, so then I, I rearranged the way that I was with my family and that became really different than the way like my brother-in-law is with his kids. Like, I mean, talk about lid flipping, like they're just like, oh my God, it's painful to be around. And yet he just thinks he's, that's, that's what he's determined is like good parent, like sets limits and like freaks out at their kids. Like, sorry, another character going through, but that's the worst one for me. That's the one I lived with when I was a kid too. Right. And, um, and that's the person I've chosen not to be. And, um, and so one of the other things that, um, you and I can't remember the other woman who was sharing um really Casey Ehrlich yeah oh, Casey so great and Casey was sharing like it means that our family looks really different than other families like the way you know our household works looks really different even even then the pressures I put on myself I, I went onto her Facebook page and I saw she wrote this whole thing about how she was like all organic all healthy foods and now it's like nope out the window right like she said something like, now my kid only eats processed food. And it's kind of the same thing in our household. You know, it's just like, I even might, the pressures I put on myself, as well as the pressures, like, again, my family of origin has put on me and their values about like, has your child learned US history? I'm like, actually, yes, on TikTok, but no, not in a classroom setting because she wants to unpack the parts of U.S. history that aren't talked about in a textbook. And that's what she's really interested in. And so, you know, it looks really different than it looks like for your kids. And so just getting into this thing about shame, because this was really, really hard for me at first. Like, I almost wanted to hide the ways our family was different from everybody else, you know, because I was worried about how they would judge it and what they would say and how they would they would tell me, oh, you've got to make different choices. And now I, because like Mel said, I found communities where I'm like, oh, you eat on a shower curtain on the floor too? So oh, cool, you know? I'm like, oh, maybe my family's not as different as I thought actually. Um, and that's really helpful. And so now it's like, we can celebrate the ways that we're different. And, and in, in conjunction with that, just to share a real time story, my kid has chosen to go back into public school. We, we, she's not been in public school since second grade and now she's in 10th grade and she's at the Burlington high school, but she's registered as a homeschooling student so that she can choose only the elective classes she wants to take at the high school. So she only takes four classes right now. And we got her report card. It's straight A's. 
I am so proud of her. And I was like, I am so proud of you. And she said, oh, she kind of did this thing. Like, it doesn't really count because I had all the advantages. Like, I only go to four classes. I have all this time to do my homework. I only take the classes I want. Like, and somehow she was like doing this internal shame thing where she was like, oh, it doesn't really count because I'm doing things I enjoy. (laughs) Why do we have that story? You know, so I tried to just tell her like, listen, there's this whole tiny little lane that's like for this like academic excellence. That's the story that was told. And I was like, and then there's the whole rest of the world to learn from. And like, what you know, and I want to celebrate how much you've learned from being in the world and finding your way in this, um, the way that makes you feel happy and, and makes your spirit, you know, sing and, and makes it easy to get a straight A's amazing you know she took such cool classes she did women in u.s history very interesting class she loved it she did dystopia and modern society what a cool class right so fun anyway if i could add to that we get a lot often we get the well how are they going to be ready for the real world and i would just like you know suggest that like what is the real world? Um, and do are, are, are we part of like reimagining all the things for the next generation um, is thinking about the, the, the things that are the real world that like shouldn't be the real world. Right. Um, and as Lizzie said, yes, our kids are going to reimagine their world mm-hmm. because the, you know, the huge responses ah! is like, you know, limbic system saying unsafe. And there's like so much that, you know, needs to be reimagined because it's unsafe. And you can't have it all the ways. Kat says, letting go of the idea that they have to go through life like I did in a particular, you know, sequential way of high school, college, jobs, about right, all of it, all of it. Mm -hmm. And if there is, back to the co-parent thing, if there is a co-parent who, and even for you yourself, if like anyone has the belief that it has to be the thing um, that is energetically its own demand. So like telling someone, you know, let go of your, it's a brain rule, um, letting go of your brain rule of how life is supposed to go in this sequential way. And then, you know, me coming along and saying, no, not that that's challenging a brain rule, which involuntarily makes them flip their lid. So that's not, that can't be the approach of getting someone to change their worldview. Um, yeah, I, you just reminded me that that was another thing that Nita made me think of, right? This with both things, whether it's with wanting to bring other people into the movement, right? Like help people understand why, what we're doing and why we're doing it, or whether it's explaining to your kid why you made these choices, like later in life when they're like, wait a second, (laughs) what? Um, I wanted to come back to what Mel had said, um, in that, in that presentation, on PDA that that your it seemed like your family value or your priority as a parent is connection and safety and always coming back to that like having these values that's helped me also explain to my kids like but wait a second I'm seeing this thing on TV or I'm hearing other kids on social media talking about all these experiences in schools they've had that I don't have why did you robbed me of that experience right and when I share with my kid oh it's because like I wanted you to feel safe and connected and you didn't feel that way at school it's like she's like oh yeah thank you so much (laughs) right like it's almost like oh you said and then she got to make that choice for herself when she's like okay but now I want to go explore that And instead of the demand being like, you're going to go to this place and you're going to get good grades and you're going to go to apply for a college and you're going to like all these things, these like expectations, it was like, I'm going to go observe this thing called school and report back. Like, okay, tell me what it's like. (laughs) And we just, we, again, we approach it as like an experiment. Um, So those are just some thoughts I have. Yeah. And if I, if I can build on that to say that, um, especially when parenting someone who's who who part of their disability is to experience your demand as threat unsafe 
if you have, you may be in a situation where you have to choose, you have to choose safety and connection and anything else. And if you have to choose, you choose safety and connection. And like, you know, I, I, I sometimes have to write it on paper and hang it on the fridge and hang it on the wall. Um, because I have to, I have to pick all the time. I have to pick all the time. And if I'm not mindful of the choice, I end up in a non-choice defaulting to my emotional habit of doing the thing and demanding the thing and judging the thing and worrying about the thing. All of it is, it's, it, I, it's that versus safety and connection. Mm-hmm. That I want to make that connection to what Travis wrote in the chat. I'm just like slowly scrolling through the chat. So Ch- Travis wrote, asking others to adapt the energy around my son is hard. Doing so takes therapy, not just learning a skill. Um, and that's so spot on. And I think that really connects to what Mel just said um, and why what I what I do, I call whole family healing because so much of it is not about learning a skill to create an outcome for my kid. So much of it for me has been unpacking my own experiences that are causing me to have those knee-jerk reactions or those like automatic reactions that happen um, where I'm going right into a demand or I'm, I'm like losing, flipping my lid, like losing my mind, I call it, right? Um, and, and that happens a lot, especially around other adults for me, mostly, actually mostly around other adults. Um, and, um, that's really, really hard because then not only am I not accomplishing the thing, which is to try to ask other adults to, um, adapt their energy, which I just, I love that term. Um, but I'm also then losing control of my own energy. And so I'm not even doing the thing. I mean, someone had mentioned modeling and that's such a huge thing for me is like, as I learn, as I grow, um, as I heal my own, um, like inner child, really like healing my childhood experiences that told me that I'm not enough. I'm, you know, dumb, not smart, all the things that were really just because I was exploring the world in my own way and in my own neurodiversity and being this wonderful creative child. And everyone was like, no, 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 get in the box, get in the box, get in the box. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I made, I created some pretty unhealthy habits, um, to try to make myself fit that. And then I do that to my kids and that causes me to run energy that says, this is my demand. Um, I'd love to close by, I, I know Sarah and I both, um, geek out about, um, some of the work of Gabor Mate and, and a recent podcast where I listened to him being interviewed about his new book. He, had this great quote um, where he says that um, in medicine, he learned that normal means healthy. It's a spectrum of being um, healthy and natural. So you can have a normal blood pressure within a certain range that's healthy and natural. But in social settings or in society, we learn that normal means like something that we're used to. And so that a lot of our practices that have been deemed normal right, by society, because like at one point, right, spanking a child was normal. Then we're like, wait a second, that's not actually healthy or natural at all. Um, you know, and, you know, different, um, you know, practices of like this concept of like self-regulation means that you leave a child to like scream and cry by themselves until they like basically give up and stop crying um, is not healthy or normal. And he says, imagine you you told a mother gorilla when her child's in distress to not go to her infant. Like that gorilla would rip your head off. Right? Like you could not stop a gorilla from growing to her child when your child's in distress. So um, you know, I love for us all to embrace our inner mother gorilla. <laughs> or father gorilla um, and, and just know that when we know our child's in distress and, and, and our gut instinct tells us, you know, what is healthy and natural for that child, no matter what society deems as normal, like we can give each other permission to, to do what we know is right. 
Thank you, Anna. That was beautiful. And thank you so much for being here. And thank, thank, thank all of you for being here. Um, for and, me. and, um, our, our, uh, I'm distracted by things popping visually. Um, sorry. Um, our next family lunch and learn will be, I don't know what day it is, but it's always the third Wednesday. Um, so we hope to see you then. And then in the meantime, the other plug I'll, I'll, I'll make is for, for Brain Club. Um, we're doing, um, so Brain Club, as, as many of you know, is uh, free on Tuesdays at six plus, plus recorded six Eastern. Um, but related to this topic, um, this in two weeks on the 28th, on Tuesday, the 28th, um, we'll be doing our first book chat. So uh, most people will not have read the book because, uh, you know, when would you do that? Um, uh, but we're going to be talking about more about shame. Um, so it's it's a discussion on um, Brene Brown's book. I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Um, so anyway, we we hope we hope to see you there. So uh, thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everyone. Bye.